am. But this morning, I really wanted to delve in a little bit into the topic of effective communication and persuasive communication in light of all the craziness. How can we cut through the noise and actually be effective when it comes to engaging people to win, especially as far as electoral victory, but also in general? How can you have a decent conversation when people maybe want to shut shut off any views that they disagree with? Or what can we do in that regard? Let's talk about all this with Rashini Rajkumar, who's a licensed attorney, crisis strategist, and media analyst. She's a former TV reporter called upon by media across the U.S. for commentary about crisis management, courtroom messaging, political strategy, and PR blunders. She's a legal analyst for Court TV and a political analyst for various stations, including one in Detroit. And I have often had her on here on KNUS. She's a leadership analyst for a TV station in Minnesota, where she hails from in Minneapolis. From 2012 to 2021, she hosted Real Talk with Rashini Sundays on WCCO Radio. And she's the author of Communicate That, a tremendous book in its third edition, Rashini Rajkumar rejoins me here on the Jimmy Sangenberger Show. Good morning, Rashini. How are you? Good morning. Happy Saturday, Jimmy. Happy Saturday to you as well. It's good to have you. Uh, it's been a little while since we've had a chance to connect. And I was like, you know, it's been too long. Got to have Rashini on, especially as we're now here in Colorado through the primaries. We're going into our general election and that means effective, persuasive communication becomes all the more important if you're trying to win, if you're trying to persuade, whatever that is. And I want to get to that in just a moment. But we have some news, of course, that came about a few weeks ago when the United States Supreme Court announced in a decision they released that they were overturning Roe versus Wade. And now, of course, all across the country, you have a lot of dissent, you have differing views, you have different kinds of laws. Here in Colorado, we have one of the most extreme abortion laws in the country. On the other side, you have states that are completely banning abortion. Uh, what is your sense for this Roe versus Wade decision, especially as the licensed attorney, Rashini, for starters? And then I want to get into a little bit of the politics of it. Well, you know, there are so many layers to this, Jimmy, way back to when the Dobbs draft was leaked. I was horrified, law school classmates of mine, other people in the legal community could not understand how something like that could get leaked. I mean, that that is really egregious that that even happened because that set off everything that then followed. Uh, and I think if that hadn't been leaked, we I'm not saying we wouldn't have had, you know, people as emotional as they are, but I think there would have been a little more uh, reasoned reaction to it. So here's what I'm going to tell you. And, and I say this as someone who is pro-choice. The Dobbs decision is actually accurate on the law. For Justice Alito to say that Roe v. Wade was incorrectly decided or, or really analyzed uh, the opinion from 73, he's actually correct. I mean, the thing is, of course, we have interpreted, reinterpreted the Constitution, a very, you know, an old document in, in the history of our country, and we've brought it uh, into modern times over the different decades. But it really, the 73 decision really didn't do anything to solidify some kind of right to abortion because it didn't really even explain how the right to privacy, which we respect in this country, uh, could en envelop a, a right to abortion. So just on the law, I say this, you, people have to discern what's the difference between your emotions, your opinions, and what's happening with the law. So on the law, Alito got it right in his Dobbs decision. The Supreme Court basically overturning Roe v. Wade. But here's the thing, from 73 to 2022, the U.S. Congress, the, the legislature, the legislative body of our country, had all those decades to codify a right to abortion. So that's really where we have to go to. Something like this is in the hands of legislative bodies around the country, whether you're talking about state legislatures or the United States legislature. The bottom line, the justices weren't having any opinion. That, that is not what they do. They, of course, they put out an opinion, but the opinion is supposed to be based in the law. It's not their personal opinion. And I know that gets a little muddled because people talk about conservative justices or liberal justices. There are a lot 
of conservative justices and liberal justices in the past who have basically in you know gone in favor of something that wouldn't align with those politics. So we cannot attribute politics to the justices. And that's really the problem mm. I'm having with the narrative that's happening lately, the protests, the the death threat against Kavanaugh. I mean, th this is just ridiculous, people. Well, Rashini, it's interesting to hear some of your analysis. I definitely would say you're in good company if you consider yourself pro-choice and also believing that Roe was poorly decided because the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg also shared that exact viewpoint. She did not believe that Roe was the right way to go about addressing a so-called right to an abortion and would have done it in a fundamentally different way. And it's interesting, given that so many of those who were upset and think that the Supreme Court did the wrong thing here in overturning Roe also are among the greatest celebrators of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the notorious RBG, as they like to call her. And I find that fascinating. So on the one hand, I would like you to, to sort of piggyback off of that. But also in terms of these protests, you have a guy in Maryland in the county where two justices, including Kavanaugh, live, who's like the county manager or something like that, who says that they're not going to enforce a law in that county that forbids protests at private residences. He literally said, we're not going to do that. The court's acting politically. This is just democracy is basically what he's saying. And to me, that's outrageous. Yeah, you could sit and say the court or the courts, depending on which jurisdiction you're talking about, act politically based on you just don't like what they decide. I mean, that's not what we were built on. We were built on the judicial branch of, of the country was to take these statutes and pass case law and and really look at what's precedent, look at what's on the books, look at the Constitution and decide, is this legal? That is what the Supreme Court, that is what any court does. Now, it's not to say there haven't been rogue judges over the decades, over the, the centuries, but really, I mean, I have interviewed so many judges in my time from state court, federal court, uh, definitely spent some time with a now passed away, retired Eighth Circuit. I mean, he was an Eighth Circuit um, Court of Appeals Justice. And they they don't do things based on their own personal lives. They sit there and they read and they study and they listen to arguments. So it's really the attorneys that stand before them that have the job of persuading one way or the other. But they've got to persuade based on the law. And let me just clarify this. So people are talking about this right to abortion. I mean, that is a it's an unfortunate phrasing. The reason that I am pro-choice is because I don't want anyone telling me what to do with my body. That's why I am pro-choice. I don't think any governmental figure should tell any American what to do with their body. Do I want abortion to happen? Absolutely not. But we have not even begun to have the discussion about preventing pregnancy, about making sure young people get educated, about you know birth control, what are the, what's the reality versus the myth, all of those conversations. Why can't we put the energy sure. uh, and the emotion that's happening right now around our country into that, right? Well, uh, Let's even having a, the even possibility of abortion. Uh, even having a, a, a basic discussion or allowing room for a discussion about these issues and where you draw the line as far as abortion. Like here in Colorado, where we have one of the few partial birth abortion clinics in the country in Boulder – uh, I think most people would say, wait a second, that's something that maybe shouldn't be happening, uh, except for, well, I think any, mo most people would say under any circumstance that you shouldn't have that. But that's right. neither here nor there. The point is we can't even have the discussion, which leads me to the bigger question that I wanted to pose to you today. Rashini Rajkumar, again, our guest, communication and crisis coach, is not on you know where you fall on any of these particular issues, but how in this moment when we have – People showing up at justice ha justices houses to do protests when we have the kind of rage in this moment when both sides seem to have such discord, how to cut through the noise and allow for and bring about effective and persuasive communication. Now, that's a very broad question. We could do hours 
talking about that. But what's sort of your top line view amidst all the the angst and the unwillingness to listen? How can we actually cut through the noise and engage in effective and persuasive communication, Rashini? Well, step one is just each of us needs to calm down. You know, this is just really emotional. And I always say to my clients, the calmer you are on the inside, the more powerful you are on the outside. So if you are going to engage, whether in public discourse or with your neighbors or with your family members about this topic or other hot topics, the first step is to really control your own emotions. I'm saying, I'm not saying you can't be passionate and emotional and have your own uh, ethical viewpoint on something, but you need to calm down in the first place and use language that whomever you're speaking with can understand and isn't feeling attacked just from the get-go. So diffusing emotion off the top is really good. Another big piece is that people need to get their facts straight. That's the thing. What I'm hearing uh, often and definitely seeing on certain social media outlets is people don't understand what's actually happening. They're putting erroneous statements about the law or about the facts out into, you know, whatever, the atmosphere, and then those perpetuate. And so often people are getting emotional and fighting over inaccurate information. And those are two steps, you know, get the information straight straight and correct, be discerning, and try to leave over hyper emotion at the door mm. so you can have as calm as possible of a conversation. Mm. And third, Jimmy, people have to be willing to say their piece, but understand you might not be able to convince someone of your opinion. Mm. And that's okay. I think it's more important, and in fact, our country was built on this, freedom of speech is not about freedom to attack until someone is whipped into your state of mind, right? It is, you can share your opinion, you can be civil, and if you don't change someone's minds, it's okay. Walk away. Mm. Well, one thing that is crucial in that regard is that persuasion takes time. One conversation is not going to get somebody to totally be won over. It can take many discussions, many exposures to different views, many different uh, conversations or facts provided in your direction or somebody else's direction to actually complete persuasion. And I think there's often this sense, Rashini, that it has to happen now. And if I can't win you over now – then I maybe I'll beat you over the head, uh, rhetorically speaking, or I will, in some cases, even cut off friendships. In fact, I saw a tweet where there was some some leftist on Twitter who literally said, if you are white promoting social justice and you're still in direct contact with most of your family members, then you know, you're not actually doing it right and proudly saying I'm only in touch with three of my family members. And I'm just like, what the heck are we doing here, people? Particularly yeah, on the left there. Like, that's a crazy mentality. Yeah, I mean, you know, and, and the thing is, I am all about having thoughtful conversations, being a passionate advocate. But one of the things that I recommend to people is grow your muscle for being your tolerance for being disagreed with. And that was one of the things that I definitely honed over the nine years of my own radio show and 25 years almost as a broadcaster is everyone doesn't need to agree with me. It's okay. I can walk away from the conversation. I could, a listener, a guest, you don't have to have my same opinion, but if we give each other space to share thoughtful information and maybe enlighten each other, that's mm -hmm. a win. And so if people can understand that you don't have to convince Uncle Bobby uh, of a certain way, but hey, can I have a good conversation with Uncle Bobby and hear what he thinks? I'll tell him what I think, and then right. maybe we can just walk away and go on with our day. Well, and something that I always take away from those conversations that I've had with people I, I disagree with where we're actually able to explore issues and certainly having conversations that where we and debates where we disagree here on the radio has, I agree with you in my case as well, helped me to not take things so personally or helped me to understand I'm not always going to win somebody over no matter how persuasive I may feel an argument is. But you learn something from that conversation 
education or you should learn something about how other people approach issues where you may have a very strong view, which can then, if your goal is to persuade eventually, can then hone your ability to do that with the next person you're talking to. I feel that I have much stronger arguments because I, for example, listen constantly to leftist YouTube shows as opposed to a lot of right-wing content because I hear what the left is saying and it helps me to understand better how to combat against it or how to persuade people who may find some of their arguments compelling. Well, like you like you said, you don't persuade usually – at first uh, attempt. Mm -hmm. And even in the world of sales, you hear salespeople say it takes seven or more touches before someone will make a purchasing decision. Well, it goes, it's the same way with the the decision of your mind and and opinion. You need to hear things. And maybe you have a great conversation with your neighbor and you may still come away disagreeing, but that's going to sift it, you know, into your mind. You're going to ponder that a little more and reflect. And maybe the next time you read something or talk to your neighbor again, maybe you're both a little closer to to agreement or at least you're both enlightened to a higher state so that's what i hope people can really aspire to because i still am very disturbed with uh some of the very tenets of our country are not being respected and that is everyone has a right to speak his or her mind to speak their mind and i don't have the right to attack you just because you don't agree with me we have to remember that as americans uh, I think true words have rarely been spoken. Rashini Rajkumar, our guest, just a final question for you in terms of the language of persuasion or methods of going about it. What do you think folks should keep in mind? For example, I've been talking with um, candidates and whatnot much more about stories and storytelling and actually saying here is an issue from the perspective of, let's say, crime. This is an experience I've had or my neighbor has had that then shows that you understand what is wrong in a more visceral way than just telling the person, oh, I get it. Here are the statistics about crime. If you can show that you feel it more, then they're going to be more willing to listen, especially if what you're sharing has an emotional tinge to it where somebody's like, I want to hear more about this story that you are telling me. Yes, exactly. And and if you are talking with candidates and, you know, all over the country now, candidates are, you know, getting out there doing grassroots efforts, ask them direct questions, you know, say, hey, this happened with my mother. What are you going to do so this doesn't happen to someone else's mother? You know, ask very direct questions. But as you say, using real life stories, anecdotes, elements so that you can get some real answers and they get out of their political speak well, and, and hopefully and, and Rashini, respond with you as a human. I'm also talking about candidates themselves who yeah. should be telling stories and talking oh, in a for way. Sure. Yes. Well, this is the political speak that they need to stop doing. I mean, yes. it's pretty clear both parties um, are not winning over a, a lot of people right now. So that's going to be the key is as a candidate, how real are you? How authentic are you? How able are you to go off the talking points and just speak like a human being that's what i judge when i listen to anyone and do so consistently as well when you're a candidate so that people don't hear you say one thing or sound in one way in one speech and then something entirely different in the next or the same goes for interviews rashini rajkumar OwnYourWow.com is her website. Check out her book, Communicate That. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. I really appreciate your time, as always. Thank you, Jimmy.